Good afternoon, thank you. That's probably the nicest intro that, I'll, that I've ever gotten and maybe ever will get. So uh, I'll enjoy that. And uh, I thank everyone for coming. I really appreciate it. Uh, I see a lot of friendly faces, a lot of new faces. Uh, so let's get right into it. The goal today is, because we have so many folks, especially in the EMPA program, that have so many uh, backgrounds in dealing with government and NGOs, is that we'll talk for about a half an hour. If there's any questions that you have during the slides, or if there's anything that I'm presenting that you don't understand, uh, feel free to stop me. But if you have questions or things that you want to contribute, I'd prefer it for you to wait till the end. And we can always go back to that slide as well. All right. But uh, my hope is that you'll learn a little bit from my presentation, and I will learn a lot from you. Together, all of our heads together, we can learn a lot. Uh, so let's roll right into it. The agenda today is I'm going to give you an introduction. And actually, Martha gave a, a pretty solid piece of that, that introduction. Then we're going to talk about the LOGAR OCCP, which is the Operational Coordination Center Provincial. We'll talk about their mission and background. We're going to talk about a framework just uh, if you think about, especially for the folks that are in the executive MPA leadership, the mid-career leadership programs, we're going to talk a little bit about like what Cotter says and what Professor O'Keefe says about uh, leading organizations and trying to lead change in organizations. That's really what this, what this talk is about today. Uh, then we're going to roll into some of the issues that I had at the OCCP. And then we'll get into conclusion and discussion. And I'm hoping for some feedback from, from you guys. Uh, as far as your experience in your home institutions and organizations. All right. Hopefully I'm going in the right direction here. So just a little more background about me. Uh, as, as Martha said, I started out as an engineer squad leader. We can go back even a little bit further. Uh, I joined the Army in, in 1993. And in 1996, I was sitting in Bosnia. And there were these crazy guys. Uh, and they would go out every day, and when they'd leave camp, you'd hear explosions going off all around the area. And they came back in, and I started talking to them. I said, hey, what do you guys do? Who are you guys? And they said, oh, we're the sappers. We're the engineers. And I said, wow, the first time, the first opportunity I get to change my job, I want to become a sapper. I want to become an engineer. And uh, if that wasn't crazy enough, I said, I'm going to go and become an airborne engineer. And so uh, I joined the 82nd Airborne Division. And somewhere following 9-11, I found myself in Afghanistan. And we were doing the same stuff that was going on in Bosnia. We were going out, finding enemy caches, and blowing stuff up. You might not hear the sound, but you should see an effect. Nice. Down here at the bottom is just a, I don't know if you can see it, this here is just a small amount of the captured enemy ordnance that we had up here in this little bowl that we destroyed that day. The strange thing is, as many crazy and dangerous uh, situations that I found myself in, nothing was probably scarier than mentoring these dudes <laughs> in Afghanistan. I had found myself in a, lot of, in a lot of situations that I was very comfortable with, but in this case here, I was way outside of my comfort zone. Uh, these guys were really nice, really friendly, but I just hadn't had the experience or the tools to, uh, to train these gentlemen. And we'll get into some of the issues that I had as we go along. So just, uh, just for your frame of reference, where is the LOGAR uh, OCCP? LOGAR is just below this pink area right here. The capital of Kabul is the pink area. Uh, and then Logar province, it's just below it. Poli Alam is the district center, which is, so that's the provincial capital. Uh, and near Poli Alam is where the OCCP was, was located. So what is an OCCP? Just, just as uh, we, we talked about earlier, it was established in 2008 by presidential decree in preparation for the Afghan national elections. Uh, the, the second national elections. Now the strange thing about this is if you think about it, whether it's in your home country or in the United States, the Afghan national elections took place on 20 August 2009. 
And as I just said, the presidential decree occurred in 2008. It was springtime. And so we're talking about 18 months to get a program up and running so that we can provide support to the Afghan national elections. Even in the United States, a lot of these programs don't occur in that fast as a speed, in that much, in that much time. And then these are just pictures of, uh, of all the folks that had to come together to make the OCCP run, and not only run, but to coordinate the elections. So you'll see we have uh, over here in the lower left-hand corner, we've got folks from the National Election Committee. The guys across the table in the funny uniforms are the Czech Provincial Reconstruction Team. So these are NATO allies from, uh, from uh, the Czech Republic, military folks. Uh, and they were training uh, some of the Afghan police. If you go over to, uh, to your right, you'll see uh, Governor Ludin is the guy in civilian clothes in the middle. And then the general that I supported was General Mirjan, and he is in, in the lower corner here. And then here again, you see some American soldiers, you see some Afghan police, and then uh, Colonel Chris Combi, who is from the, the French OMLT, another team that trains military forces, and he was training the artillery, the Afghan artillerymen, uh, to provide support also to the Afghan elections in case there were attacks at the polling sites or in some of the villages. So a lot of, lot of moving pieces here. And again, as stated earlier, the OCC's mission is to plan, integrate, synchronize, coordinate the efforts among Afghan national security forces in order to develop a common operational picture. What does all that mean? That's a lot of words, right? What it really means is they're collecting data from all the forces that are moving out and about on the battlefield. So there's police that are moving out, and out around the battlefield. There's uh, the Afghan National Army moving around the battlefield. And so we're collecting all the information. We're coordinating support from adjacent units. And, uh, and we're trying to gather information about what the enemy activity is so that we can plan for future operations. Does that make sense? And this is just a, a, a diagram of the OCCP's structural, uh, structure. And as you can see, where it says ANA on here, that's the Afghan National Army. So all of these different uh, staff, chief, chiefs of staff are Afghan National Army officers. And the problem which we're going to get into is when I first arrived at the OCCP, we didn't have one Afghan Army officer there. So there was nobody running any of these staff positions. The other thing to kind of understand about this situation is Afghanistan is a, a multi-ethnic and tribal society. We had people represented from uh, three of the main ethnicities and uh, a number of different tribes. We had folks that were Pashtun, we had folks that were Tajik, we had folks from Nuristan, so Nuristani, uh, and some of my interpreters were uh, uh, Hazara. If you're in Professor O'Keefe's class, you'll recognize this, all right? Uh, Professor O'Keefe says that managerial leadership is distilled down to people, process, and resources. And hopefully we can kind of get into that as I, as I talk to you about the, the issues and the problems that we had at the OCCP. All right. You'll notice in this picture, most of the folks that are in this picture are, are Afghan. And it says morale, uh, low morale, and poor discipline. And it, I wasn't I really wasn't talking about the Afghan soldiers. I was actually talking about my American soldiers, but I thought it would be rude to put pictures of my American soldiers because when I first arrived at the OCCP, I probably couldn't get a picture without them sticking their middle finger up at me. <laughs> they really, it, it just wouldn't be professional to put that on the slide. They really, morale was extremely low at the OCCP. And so here's where we start talking about the organizational problems and the organizational issues that I had when I showed up the, at the, uh, the coordination center. And so when I showed up the, 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 uh, the coordination center, I was responsible for four American soldiers and 27 Afghan national security staff and approximately 
10 of the Afghan national security staff were there. And the four soldiers that I got were all what would be considered, uh, in English we call them uh, you know, trouble cases, problem children. Uh, most of them were deemed argumentative. These are my soldiers, these are the American soldiers. They were deemed argumentative, they were deemed lazy, and sometimes deemed incompetent by their previous bosses. These are the guys that I had to work with. Uh, additionally, these guys were disrespectful to the Afghan officers, even though the Afghan officers outranked them and also were usually older than them. They didn't really care about their job performance, uh, and it just created a lot of bad relationships within the OCCP. And so I had to kind of evaluate this situation, and I took a week. My bosses didn't want me to take a week. They wanted me to just jump right in there and you gotta go in hard and you just gotta lay down the, the rules and the law. But I went in and I took a week and I walked around the camp and I looked at problems around the camp, whether it was physical structures falling down or trash or all these different things, uh, the physical security of the camp. And during those times, I'd grab a soldier. I'd grab one of my four soldiers and I'd bring him along with me and we'd talk. And, uh, and typically I'd ask them what they thought was wrong with the, with the coordination center. And what was, what was wrong with their job? And why were they being so disrespectful? And what did they think we could do to improve the situation? And so essentially I used reflective listening. So if you've been in some of these conflict classes and things like that, or some of the management classes, you'll know that reflective listening is one way to kind of get to the crux of what the problem is um, with, with, the, with the people that you're talking to and the people that you're trying to um, find a solution for the situation. And I solicited feedback from the soldiers too to talk to them about how they were going to improve their performance and improve their work. Well, all of the soldiers stated that they thought that the job was a throwaway job. They weren't working in their, in their, uh, in their job positions. Uh, and, and they just didn't want to be there. And I had said, you know, I kind of felt the same way and that we would get through it together and that I would find jobs for them that fit their career position in the Army. And so my American staff, I told you I had four of them. I had two military police officers, one signal, or one, they were all non-commissioned officers, they were all sergeants. So two military police, one signal, and another guy that was from the, the Sea Burney. Sea Burney is chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear. Is there any use for this guy in Afghanistan for our security folks? No, unless things go absolutely terrible, there is no work for this guy in Afghanistan. There's no job for this guy. But in my opinion, making their jobs, was, making their jobs better was, was actually pretty easy. And, uh, what I wanted to do to kind of improve the soldier satisfaction was the mundane duties that weren't being done were divided up into shifts. And then the non-commissioned officers were given special projects. It just makes sense. I was working with Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, and uh, the Nat National Directorate of Security. And so my military police officers taught police work classes. They also taught detainee operations. Uh, my signal officer, as you, as you may have seen on the structure slide, we were heavy on uh, signal operations because we had to call out to the adjacent forces on the battlefield to get information from them. So my signal officer, we started setting up the antennas. We started setting up the radios and communication systems. We had shortfalls on some of these radio and communication systems. So my signal uh, sergeant went out and he started begging from all the American units, do you have spare parts, do you have extra, do you have, do you have all these different items? And he brought back all these spare parts and we actually were able to build some of the communication systems that we had shortfalls in. So it was pretty, it was pretty exciting. But I still didn't know what am I gonna do with my, with my, uh, with my Seaburn guy, my chemical, my chemical and biological NCO, this guy that had really no job. And so if you remember, if you're in Professor O'Keefe's class again, uh, chapter 19 in uh, Bowman and Deal talks about authorship. And authorship provides space 
within institutional boundaries for staff to uh, problem solve, develop solutions to their work. Think of it this way. Uh, you have an, or an orchestra and every instrument in the orchestra plays its own part, but the conductor is up there making sure everything comes out as music and sounds, and sounds beautiful, right? And so uh, all of my individual soldiers uh, were playing their own instrument, playing their own part, to produce a final product which was running the OCCP. And so what I kind of noticed was I went in one day to, uh, to do a counseling for my, my Seaburn sergeant and I wanted to talk to him. And I, I noticed when I was looking around his room, I was in his room and we hardly had any furniture. This guy had a bed, he had a table, he had built his own chair, he had walls to his room, and he had built it all himself. And he had all these tools that he had borrowed from different places. And so I, I, said, I said, who built all this stuff? He said, oh, I built all, this, all these things. I also noticed he kind of liked to be outside and he kind of liked to be alone and away from everybody. Well, I, I looked at this guy and I said, aha. I said, you are gonna be uh, my, new, my, new, uh, my new camp improvement guy. That's, and it's exactly what we needed. We had all these large buildings here, and I wish I had inside before pictures, but all these large buildings were empty. They were just these big cavernous spaces. And what you can see right here, we had a, just tons and tons of wood all over the camp. And so he said about Dividing up all those large cavernous buildings, we had to help him build some of the walls, but he, we together, we went and built all the walls. He built all of the frames. He built the stadium style seating. He built the, the tables, uh, and he built all the shelving in our, and I kept him working the whole time. Kept him working and happy the whole time. And these were just things that we didn't have uh, in, our, in our organization that we required to do our work. But let's get on to the, let's get on to the, uh, the, the, mil the Afghan military folks. They say if you build it, they will come. It's kind of Field of Dreams. Anybody heard of Field of Dreams? So we built this OCCP. I set my guy out to work. And we started getting more and more of our staff in. These uh, Afghan army guys that, uh, that hadn't been there when I first showed up, actually started coming. And so we started to get fully staffed. And uh, so I sat down with each of the Afghan military folks, uh, three men at a time, one from the Afghan National Army, one from the NDS, and one from the Afghan uh, National Police. And, uh, and we just, we conducted interviews uh, through an interpreter, but I would usually introduce myself uh, in Dari and I'd ask them how they were, and just simple pleasantries. Uh, and it was great, and they started asking me about my deployment experience, and I started telling them, Nilab and I were talking before this, I started telling them about Iraq, and, uh, and I told them that I had earned the name Abdullah in Iraq, uh, which means uh, servant to no one but God, as far as I know if I'm translating this right. And I guess my assertiveness training the Iraqis gave me a, a, a reputation of being subservient to, to no one. And the Afghans love this. And so uh, it's hard to see in the pictures, but they made me a name tape that said Abdullah. Uh, and I wore this, which actually upset a lot, of my, um, a lot of my senior officers. I wouldn't wear it when I was on the American camps, but I'd wear it when I was on the Afghan camps. And uh, the reason I did that was it, it, for me, it helped establish a relationship. All the Afghan officers, when they, when they put on their uniform, had in English their name. And I would ask some of them, I said, what does that mean? And they said, oh, well, it says Afghan Army or it says Afghan Police. They didn't realize it said their name. And I said, I said well, I, I said, it also says your name. I said, and so when they gave me this name tape, I wore it all the time. And when we would go to meetings with Americans and Afghans together, 
my interpreter, this guy right here, Peter was his English name, um, would say, did you know the only person that they reference by name is you? I was one of the lowest ranking people in the room. But because I had reached out culturally to the folks that I was teaching, the only, they would say that guy, or they would say this one, uh, or the tall guy, or whatever. But when they would reference me, they would say, well, we were working with Abdullah, or Abdullah said this or that. And so I, that was one of the first steps in just making a very simple connection. And it was something that was kind of really ruffled the feathers of, uh, of my military bosses the, on the American side. Uh, but it was something that I felt like I had to do to make an, a con connection. And this simple connection, this simple relationship building of conducting interviews and taking on a name that was an Afghan name and then writing it in the local language created a, forged a really good bond and a really good connection. So I found jobs for my American soldiers. I started interviewing a lot of the Afghan security officers to get to know them, to establish a relationship between them and myself. Uh, I was able to adopt my Abdullah name, and they gave me this name tag. And then we continued on in our, in our team building. And it was really strange because this team, this team building event uh, wasn't something that was, that it, it just kind of came out of the blue. It came, it came very organically. And uh, the initial team building developed around a daily activity, and it was really, really simple. Uh, we just started to play together. So as, after the day was over and we had done our shift change brief, uh, and we had done, we completed all our classes, I noticed that my Afghan interpreters uh, and the Afghan security guards would play soccer and volleyball together. And they were enjoying themselves immensely, and they started inviting myself and the NCOs over. And then we additionally invited a lot of the Afghan officers. Uh, you can see there's an Afghan police officer there, and then some of the guys in the background, they'd throw on civilian clothes to play volleyball. I did not play soccer or football. I'm not good at that. Um, but the thing about this is, is when you're playing sports, you're developing cohesion, you're developing healthy competition, you're developing teamwork, and you're doing it all without a translator. You know, when you pick somebody up off the pitch and you slap somebody on the back and you say a good game or when you score a point and everybody's cheering together, that really builds up this team mentality. And I mean, most of all, after a long stressful day, we had fun. And this actually led to the NCOs and myself being invited to lunches and dinners. That was like the, the, the lunch that you saw in the previous um, slide. And, uh, and also sometimes the Afghan officers would bring out some chai and uh, karbuza. If, if you're from Afghanistan, karbuza I think translates into donkey melon, right? Karbuza, it's from up in the north. It's my favorite, it's like a Crenshaw. It's like a Crenshaw melon uh, if you're from, from here in the States, best. Uh, but again, just kind of develop the relationships. Not all my experiences in the OCCP were, were rosy or fun-filled. There was a lot of work as well. And one experience that really uh, was kind of embarrassing to me was uh, occurred in the OCCP uh, radio room. So every day we were taking in reports of enemy activity. And uh, I had taught the Afghans a very simple report that I had asked them to use every day so that we could pass it along to both the Americans and the other Afghan forces on the battlefield. And eventually they got it and they started using it quite a bit. So anytime there was an attack or an explosion, uh, this report was filled out by the Afghan shift officer. And one day, one of my sergeants ripped a piece of scrap paper out and he jotted down some information and just kind of gave it to the, the Afghan shift officer. And he said to me, he said, what is this? How come this report is good enough for us, but it's not good enough for you guys to use? And like I said, I was extremely embarrassed. So I took the piece of paper and I wrote it in the report format. But the thing that I learned that day was, if it's good enough for the people that you're training, if it's good enough for the people that you're mentoring, it's good enough for you to use. It's good enough for the instructor to use. 
and that we had to conform to established norms within the OCCP. Another problem that I had uh, was, as I said in the beginning, we, we were trying to, to, to put this OCCP together. So we had problems with the logistics and we had problems with personnel. And so the first, the first thing that I did was every week I would sit down and I would meet with the logistics officers. And we would go over the procurement paperwork, we'd go over all the order forms and all the order paperwork, and we'd forecast ordering for, for future supplies. And things to, seemed to be on track. Every week we were ordering more things to improve the camp. Every week we were ordering more things for the, for the office. And the Afghan officers and I talked about forecasting supplies for events or changes in the season. And the logistics officers started leaving every few days to go pick up supplies. And everybody that was left back in the camp, we got excited. We had ordered all these supplies. We were waiting for computers and calculators and heaters because winter was coming and it was going to get cold. And, uh, the logistics officers, the supply officers, would return with maybe a box of pens, some paper. And I said, how come we're not getting the right support? And I'd go and I'd check over the paperwork again. And the logistics officers and I would agree that we needed this stuff. And they wouldn't return with any of the large quantity items or any of the big ticket items. And as I mentioned, it was getting close to winter. And big ticket items like electric heaters were only procured at one heater per officer. But on our camp, we had rooms for every officer and 10 large common areas and all sorts of other rooms. But the reason the logistics officers didn't get more supplies for us was out of fear, culturally. Maybe you can understand this. They were afraid that they would be accused of corruption or theft. And all of this kind of came to a head during an argument. Uh, you know, it was early winter and we were sitting there shivering in the logistics, the supply office. And I said, you know, we wouldn't be freezing if we had ordered more heaters. And one officer that was usually extremely quiet looks up at me and he started yelling. I've never seen this guy yell before. And he said, would you have me go to jail for a heater? He stated, we have 27 officers, we get 27 heaters, and if I have any extra, the higher-ups will claim that, I'm, that uh, I'm stealing them or selling the extra ones. And I was so focused on getting the things that we needed for the camp, uh, it was until that time that I, I never uh, really realized, uh, you know, I was so focused on that problem, I was too scared uh, to, to, really, to really see what was going on. And so, uh, and so eventually after we opened those lines of communication, after that officer was, okay. So we're getting pretty close. I've rambled on a little too long here. I want to just talk about, the point of, the point of that story really was just to, to show you that in organizational leadership, you're trying to get, you're trying to get, you get an idea and you want to, you want to get change and you want to make things better, but a lot of times when in attempts to make things better and when you're really focused on the end state, a lot of times we lose sight of the communications process. That's really the point of, of telling that story there. And so before we wrap it up, I just want to talk about one last thing. And that was uh, a final training event that, that really, really hit home for our Afghan officers. And that was planning for the second national uh, Afghan elections. And so what this is here, it looks like just a field with maybe some tents in the background. But what this here is, uh, is something called a terrain model. All right? It's a map with relief. It's a giant map. It has relief. And this one's about as big as a soccer field. And so when you, when you place locations on this map, they're placed on a map with a grid to tell what the exact location is. If you guys think of your GPSs in your cars or on your telephones, right? Your, uh, 
your GPS will give you an eight to 10 digit grid. And so we could rehearse all of our operations on this map. We had to uh, transfer a map to the ground there. We used wood, we used soil, we used rock, we used spray paint, we used um, uh, rope. And after months of my, my sergeants and myself trying to teach the Afghan officers how to read a map, doing this activity, it just kind of clicked for them. Just that physical hands-on, it kind of clicked for them. And so they were able to build this map, place city locations and mountaintops and polling centers uh, and all the different terrain and relief, accurate down to an eight-digit grid, and they were able to produce 10-digit grids for all the polling sites uh, so that our artillery officers knew where, to, where it was safe to fire, where it was not safe to fire, and also where we were going to place Afghan troops to provide security for all our polling centers. And so this was a really big deal event because all of the skills, everything that we had been teaching the Afghan officers uh, over this course of time, all kind of came together and they actually kind of got it. And it was this, this physical activity. And then the other thing was, because we were all working together, it produced more great teamwork and, uh, and just a, a more cohesive team. And we really enjoyed working together. Uh, and so just, you can see a little better the different locations on the map that we had put down and the use of the spray paint. And uh, what this translated into was, when we were collecting data on the battlefield in the future, after the Afghan elections were over, all of my intelligence officers were able to go and plot events on a map. They were able to collect intelligence and data together. They were able to uh, plan operations for some of the other units and actually get to supporting the other units the way they needed to. Just more shots of the map. The really cool thing was, after the Afghan national elections, uh, we did more events where we invited other Afghan units, army units and police units, to come and do all of their rehearsals for any operations that they were doing within Logar province uh, on, on this map. And we provided all of the intelligence support on that map and it was vetted by the unit. So we were able to provide a lot of, a lot of great information. It's just a closing shot again. That my, uh, my communications officer said he was so good that he could listen to two, two radios at once. So we never really got to this. But we're going to get to this, and, we're gonna, and then we'll, we'll open it up to discussion. So Cotter has eight stages of change in an organization. And uh, create a sense of urgency was, is, the first, is the first step in this. And as I stated at the very beginning, uh, we had the Afghan national elections coming up. So uh, when I found myself in the position at the OCCP, I, we were six months out from the Afghan national elections. And uh, presidential decree had put it out 18 months before that. So the sense of urgency was already there. Uh, form a guiding coalition. Again, I talked, we talked about I had four NCOs. Uh, they were very disrespectful in the beginning. The morale was very low. But by giving them a sense of purpose in their job and in their careers uh, and finding good jobs for them that they could be very proud of, uh, I was able to kind of develop my coalition. I was able to further develop the coalition by conducting my interviews with all the Afghan of officers. And these Afghan officers and I started to develop a relationship by getting to know each other. Uh, and then started to create a vision. And we talked a little bit, some of my stories about, we had created a vision, which probably wasn't very clear in my presentation, but we created a vision that the coordination center was going to be a place, a watershed, for us to gather all sorts of intelligence 
so that we could help plan operations to adjacent units on the battlefield. Uh, and then empower others to act on the vision. I think we did this, but there were a few situations where lines of communication were down. Uh, quick wins. Quick wins could be our playing together, playing volleyball and soccer together. Just these quick ways to maintain and reestablish relationships. Uh, build on the change. We had the Afghan national elections and we had done our terrain model, our map, our giant map. And then after that, we invited units to come and conduct rehearsals on that map and we provided a source of intelligence uh, for those folks. And then that also kind of institutionalized the change. Because we kept on hosting events where we were hosting adjacent unit operations to come in, uh, we had to improve our map, we had to maintain our map, and we had to maintain our source of intelligence. So this was our institutionalization of change. All right, so I've talked long enough, I've bored you long enough. Uh, but we have people from, from uh, from NGOs and international organizations, so we have some time to, to talk about your experience. So that, that'll, that'll complete my portion of talking, but I'll try to stimulate thought and questions and things like that. Questions? Go ahead. So this, this, when you were in Afghanistan, yeah. attacks? It was right around the same time, and so something that I didn't talk about was how did I get the job? I was, I was a lieutenant. So for, in the officer world, that's really low ranking. Uh, and I replaced the guy that was a promotable captain. So in, in, for a scope of reference, because I know the ranks probably don't mean a lot, usually a lieutenant is about three or four years in the Army. Uh, and I had been enlisted before, so that's why I had so much extra time. Uh, and a guy that's either a senior captain or a major has probably been in the Army eight to ten years. So about half the time. Uh, and the guy that, and you, this is getting to your green on blue portion of the question, the guy that I replaced, we did start to see um, some threatening activity and uh, some injuries in some of the adjacent units, but not on our camp. And I told you that the Afghan Army folks hadn't shown up by the time I had gotten there. Our Afghan police colonel showed up one day out of the blue without really announcing himself. And um, my predecessor was surprised in his office. And when the Afghan colonel came in, he drew his weapon on him. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So for, for, um, for non-military folks, green on blue, uh, we assign color codes to different uh, organizations on the battlefield, and so green is the Afghan security forces and blue is the U.S. military forces. So there were, there were, there were situations where folks were training a lot of times on weapons ranges, and you would find that somebody from the Taliban or possibly Al-Qaeda had, had um, infiltrated the unit and then would attack uh, ISAF or NATO uh, train trainers. But yeah, my predecessor actually was very fearful of this stuff. And um, he drew his weapon on the, the incoming colonel. And then I got, I got the job because one day he just, he had been deployed on multiple occasions before. And he went into our boss's office. He set his weapon on his desk and said he, didn't, he wouldn't need it anymore. And they sent him home as a, as a mental casualty. And so they said, Williams, we don't have anything for you. And we're just, you know, slap on the rear end and get in the game. Uh, and so that's how I found myself in that, that position. I had already fulfilled all my other lieutenant positions. Stateside, I had trained my platoon, which is a tw platoon's about 28 men. And then I had my executive officer time, which is for the engineers is about 78 men. So you're second in command to 78 men. Other questions? Go ahead, Alex. John, concerning your idea about this name, Abdullah. Yeah. I'm from the perspective of our last officer here. Uh, don't you think 
think uh, that uh, such uh, additional um, desire to create uh, these uh, relationships a little bit uh, undermine your power uh, from a perspective of American soldiers uh, who behave this You know, that's, that's really, that's, that's absolutely true. Go, was there more? And uh, maybe you have some uh, situations when Afghan uh, soldiers and officers were not very, were not friendly, but also kind of familiarity yeah. during communication. Don't, didn't you have such problems, uh, negative uh, examples of this uh, more close Right. I understand what you're saying. So, and I guess we can unpack it just a little bit, right? So from the American soldier perspective, the soldiers on my camp, that probably would have, that could have created a discipline problem. It really could have, because now you've got soldiers just slapping whatever they want on their uniform. And so for, for the military, you don't want people putting extra things on their uniform that don't belong there. So uh, absolutely. Uh, fortunately, my soldiers, they were so, <laughs> they, were, they were really, they, they were just so, um, they weren't the best of soldiers. So just, just the small increments and improvements on their discipline were better than, there was never that question. But yes, there was potential for that question to come up. Um, I had a boss, so somebody that was senior to me, that came on the camp one day. And when I would go to the American camp, I would take off the, because it's Velcro. It's Velcro on the back. So I would just pull it off and I'd put on my name tape with my last name. And um, so when I'd go on the American camp, I would wear my regular name tape and my uniform looked very normal. And one day I had my boss come down and visit uh, and it was unexpected. And he came and he just ripped the name tape right off. And he says, you'll wear the proper name tape. And I put the proper name tape on. And that's when my interpreter said to me, he says, you know, in all of these meetings, he goes, don't be upset. He goes, just put on your name tape and be happy. But he was the one that kind of put me in the right frame of mind. He said, in all of these meetings, all of these bosses, all of these powerful people that, that outrank you, they don't use their name. They never say their name. They just say that guy. But they always talk about you and they always say Abdullah. And he goes, you can hear that love in their voice. They, and you can hear the respect in, your, in their voice because you have chosen to kind of uh, accept a little aspect of the culture. But my boss who had ripped that off, he said that I had gone bamboo, I had gone native, which is kind of like an old British term, uh, and that I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't have gone bamboo or native. So all of the Afghan officers that were there outranked me. Uh, I was training all of them, but they, they all outranked me in, in age, experience, and uh, in military experience, and in military grade. The good thing that kind of kept the structure for me was uh, we had an Afghan general. He was the top guy in our structure. Uh, and I essentially worked almost like an aide to him. So while I didn't wear his rank, um, the respect was still there because I was working so closely with the general. So, but you know, the other thing that Neil Abba was talking about, which is something that I kind of wanted to ask everyone here, because we have so many people that have worked for organizations, whether it's the UN or USAID, is, so it was very difficult, and again, it probably didn't come across very well in the slides, and I apologize for that, but it was very difficult to implement a lot of change in the organization because I came from this big, cumbersome organization myself called the United States Army. And so there was a lot of things that I had to do to conform to Army standards while still trying to kind of facilitate change within the OCCP. And I was trying to come up with innovative ways to train the folks at the OCCP. So I just wanted to, I, I just kind of wanted to crowdsource or canvas the crowd. If you've, if you've worked in USAID or the UN or another international organization, did you find that the structure of the American organization uh, was too constrictive? Or did you find situations where you had a person like myself, an extremely low-ranking person, that had to come in and work with the host nation folks, but then had a lot of restrictions from 
the higher ups in the organization. Does anybody want to comment on that or does anybody have experience with that? You guys didn't know it was going to be question and answer time with the questions going this way. Yeah. Myself, yeah. We had uh, folks working for the program, so they were like kind of assigned as the better advisors. Right. But they were like, like they don't have any any sort of like like government grant, but they were closely working with, with directors of right. like the DGs, directors general. Right. Right. But they were like like working there without any. Uh, any like government uh, job or responsibility, right. they still their job would carry the same the, the same weight as the DG. Okay. So, and uh, in his absence, like he would advise them. Right. Well, it was advised, but he had like a lot of influence. There. Right. Do you think the United States is sort of with the sort of integrated operation between Afghan and American forces? Do you think the U.S. is sort of setting up the Afghan as a family? pull out and logistics aren't there the air power isn't there. Are they starting to get used to Right. You know, there was a time when I couldn't answer this question. And I really, really the only thing you're I couldn't officially answer that question probably, but um, and now the only thing you're getting is opinion. So I'll, 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 I'll just say this. The Afghan forces that I worked with uh, were extremely professional and extremely brave. Uh, the Afghan forces that I worked with, particularly dealing with uh, counter improvised explosive devices because that was my life prior to working at the Logar OCCP. These guys were doing it without robotics. These guys were doing it without the full protection that a lot of the American soldiers use. Uh, so I see that the will to fight is there in a lot of the units. Uh, the will to fight is there among a lot of the junior soldiers. And the leadership is there. The unfortunate thing is, like in a lot of places, to include the United States, there is a, still quite a bit of corruption and problems, especially at the mid-level, because at the mid-level is where you have aspirations, but you don't have a lot of the power or authority. So I don't think... Uh, if large scale operations, yes, you need that air support. I think that air support's gonna be there for a lot longer. I think you're gonna see that, that occur. Uh, I don't think we'll make the same mistakes that we made in, in other theaters of operation. Uh, so I, I think you'll see that we'll keep some of those airfields. Obviously, it depends on whether or not the Afghans want us there uh, and whether or not we'll, we'll continue with the SOFA agreement. So SOFA is a status of forces agreement, which allows us to remain in country. Well, I just want to say, yeah. just, just briefly, because yeah. you must take the, the whole, I mean, the focus of the decision somewhere else. Yeah. It's, well, you mentioned about the corruption. That's a very tiny part of, part of it. Afghan forces, the whole uh, national security forces, what's any, whether it's uh, right. India's, whether it's any. They are, they are all very committed. Yes. But the problem is with the policy. And the policy is from the United States. And there is another, another outside factor to it, which has really mastered and, and, and pretending that they are helping the United States and getting billions of dollars for counterterrorism, for, for combating terrorism. Right. In fact, they are, they are supplying terrorism, and they are, uh, they are actually training terrorism. And it's it's not a puzzle. It's not a myth. It's not it's not very mysterious. It's it's very black and white. There is no gray area in it. But I don't know why. Like from time to time, people in the United States, either inside the government or outside the government, they point it out. But then nobody can do anything. It just swept up uh, under the carpet. Then. But everybody knows that. Look at these three three leaders of Al Qaeda and Taliban. Osama bin Laden was killed in, in Abu Dhabi, which is the which is one of the, uh, the very uh, uh, like military cities of Pakistan. Uh, Omar, uh, Mullah Omar, he was killed, uh, he, he died in Karachi. He is Taliban leader. <laughs> the new leader of Taliban, Mullah Mansur, he is in Quetta. And in, in 
an enclave. All Pakistan so cities. These are all like, like there is, there is, uh, uh, I mean, like, we, Afghanistan has been in, a, in an undeclared war with, in, in a, an undeclared state of war with Pakistan. Yeah. And that's, that's the problem. And since 9 11, Afghanistan forces and people have been paying for, for the war, which is kind of imposed on them. This is not Afghan's war, this is completely different. Thing. There, there, there are there is a power struggle between between superpowers and uh, and, and benefits of, of of other countries. We are fighting war between the United States, Soviet Union, with former Soviet Union, Russia now. We are fighting here the war between Pakistan and India. We we are we are here to uh, we are actually fighting the war which which has a lot of stakes for China. For, for all these these emerging uh, superpowers, it's it's not it's not about Afghan forces or about corruption. It's it's a lot of like like they're underlying other uh, other facts that, that that especially United States, State Department, Department of Defense, Congress, and White House they really need to and CIA. To, <laughs> yeah, yeah, CIA. Yeah. They, they, no. they really need to see see the problem and stop. And stop actually like indirectly uh, funding these terrorist networks. Nikib, I understand everything that you're saying, and I I believe that it's true. I I agree with you, but I think Mike's biggest question was just the from a strategic perspective, will, will are we going to see because if the United States once the United States departs, um, I think some of the some of the issues will will go away, but there's still going to be a lot of issues that are going to remain. And I'm not talking about corruption at this point in the game. I'm talking about this kind of understated war with Pakistan or the influence of outside superpowers beyond the United States. Um, so uh, something that I didn't talk about in this because it was beyond the scope of the presentation, but in Logar province we have the INAC copper mine. It's, uh, it's, it's one of the largest copper mines, it's definitely the largest copper mine in Afghanistan, one of the largest in the world. And the Chinese, I met with as many Chinese people as I met with American folks. Uh, and the Chinese folks too, uh, they had, their, their folks were in there conducting the mining operations. And the only reason I even mention this is they had hired I, my camp had funds to train 150 Afghan national police. The Chinese had hired an additional 100 Afghan police, but they didn't provide any funding to train those police. So they provided the funding to pay their salaries and maybe purchase the uniforms for them, but no training. So you had guys that had no police training that were in uniform collecting a paycheck from the Chinese. Thank you once again to John. Thanks a lot. And for all of you for sharing your thoughts and perspectives.